Well hi there folks, it's time for another Movies by Month. And as these wintry months loom large in front of us, the nights draw fair in and the weather gets from bad to worse and it seems that there's less and less things to do but curry doing in front of the sofa and watch some films. And in October, things weren't actually quite so bad, but I managed to get through a whole load of movies. In part because they gave me another free month of shudder when I tried to cancel the subscription. Honestly, it's like being on AOL again back in the 90s. They chuck you free months every time hoping you're going to forget to cancel one of these points. Well, I've actually cancelled it now, but it meant I got another month full of horror movies. But another thing that happened in October was they shut down the cinemas again. But before that actually happened, I did get in to see one last film, and that was The New Mutants. Now, The New Mutants is basically the last ever X-Men movie, or at least the last one in the way it currently goes, because the franchise has now been bought out by Disney and Marvel, and they're going to apparently reboot some of the characters using the MCU. Now, before that, we did have a whole load of X-Men movies. You probably remember some of them, you know, the, the first class ones, which were kind of a reboot that half kind of fit in with the old ones. And then there was also the Wolverine films, and they kind of were a totally mixed bag of good and bad. And again, they didn't really fit in together. So yeah, so somebody apparently at some point during all of this had an idea that they should do a YA movie, you know, to tick every box and have a film for absolutely every demographic they could think of. So they did one about some teenage mutants who are locked in a huge facility and, until they can learn to control their super dangerous powers. And originally this was actually supposed to tie into the first class timeline movies and possibly also the, the TV show Legion, which to be honest, Legion is absolutely fantastic and you should check it out if you haven't seen it. But yeah, anyway, it's not now. Um, and yeah, two years after sitting waiting for this to be released and being recut and re-edited and reshot, they kind of chucked this out and just said, look, this is its own thing. It's a standalone movie in that story universe. But that's basically it. And essentially the story is all these teen mutants in this place. And it's no surprise because apparently the big inspiration for this was The Breakfast Club with all the kids, you know, stuck in the school. Uh, you've got Nightmare on Elm Street 3, which was the one about all the teenagers who keep having weird dreams and they're all locked up in an asylum or hospital. And that's basically exactly the same as what's on here. But this doesn't actually have the innovation of any of those movies, and instead it just becomes a predictable, unsubtle, and worst of all, totally all over the place, jumping from silly to cheesy to trying to be horrifying and scary and then back again in a few seconds. So yeah, basically, it's a 2 out of 5 at best, and I kind of wish that I'd seen something better before they shut down my local cine world, yet again. But as like most of the rest of 2020, I spent the rest of my time watching things on my TV at home. And the first up of that was a film called La Llorona, and that's from Guatemala. Now, actually, I, I kind of expected when I started watching this that it was going to be a different film because I got it mixed up with an American movie called The Curse of La Llorona, which is part of the Conjuring Universe movies, you know, like The Nun and Annabelle. But now they've apparently tied it into this South American ghost lady mythology. But instead, this is actually a political film, sort of. I mean, it's still a ghost story, but yeah, it's all about the murder of native Maya people in Guatemala during the 1970s, during a massacre at a village called La Llorona, which is kind of creepily coincidental. Anyway, the movie's all about this old dictator who's going a bit senile, and he starts hearing a crying woman wandering around the house at night, and that combined with them hiring a strange and mostly silent native maid called Alma. And meanwhile, there's literally crowds of angry protesters sur surrounding the mansion and everyone's getting more and more stressed out and paranoid and having bad dreams and seeing things. And it's quite a clever little film and it's clearly got an awful lot to say about atrocities committed in the past in Guatemala. And although this was fairly low budget, it actually looks really good and the performances were pretty great, despite the fact that most of these actors aren't professional actors, as far as I can tell. So yeah, if you fancy a horror film with a bit of a political twist, then this could be the one for you. I mean, I'd say it was a 4 out of 5. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really interesting. So yeah, it's on Shudder at the moment if you've got that channel. Next up was another low budget movie on Shudder, and this time it was a Japanese zombie movie where almost half the movie is literally done in a single take, which kind of makes sense if you think about the title, which was one cut of the dead. And that's a story all about the shooting of a low budget zombie horror movie where the director's an absolute maniac and in the midst of the action real zombies start attacking the cast and crew. And what follows it is a really strange borderline fourth wall breaking piece of madness that manages to be both funny, clever and really weird at the same time. And it totally changes the game about halfway through the movie but I'm not going to actually say anything about what that is because it genuinely is just best and clever to see how it spins it into a really interesting take on the zombie movie genre that I'd never seen before. And even having said that, I can pretty much bet that you're not going to guess what it is, or not exactly. 
But yeah, anyway, it did the rounds at a bunch of horror movie festivals last year, apparently, and, and everybody loved it, and so did I. I mean, I would say it's a 4 out of 5. It's it's just there's a few little things that hold it back from being a 5 out of 5, but definitely it's probably one of the best things I've seen on Shudder if, of any of the shows that are on there. But you don't need that because you can pick it up on DVD and Blu-ray as well. So yeah, well worth your time to check out One Cut of the Dead. But moving away from horror films and into the world of historical drama, another film I saw was in an amazing movie called the true history of the Kelly Gang, and that's all about the famous Australian bandit and criminal Ned Kelly, who you might know about if you ever saw the Heath Ledger movie from about 15 years ago or so, which really went down the old kind of Robin Hood sort of route with the story, bigging it up into a big massive fairy tale of poor wee Irish Aussies and a nasty bad English lawman who was out to hunt them down. Although to be fair, it does actually portray Geoffrey Rush as being quite a reasonable policeman, you know, sent to hunt down a bad guy. But yeah, True History goes a completely different way in that it's very visually stylized, but also goes in for making you understand that these people are just people and it doesn't really mythologize things in the same way. And also how much of everybody back then was kind of a nasty piece of work who was just scraping by to survive. I mean, whether it's Ned and his brothers robbing, stealing and shooting, or the local law taking full advantage of their position to abuse or coerce money, food or even sex out of the poor folk, or how Ned's mother is utterly bonkers and kind of has a thriving hatred for the entire world. And the film ends up telling the story of Ned growing up in this kind of strange world and how it shapes him into being this criminal and also how it shapes him into finding his weird destiny. It is still, however, an absolutely amazing human story and you get a real sense of Ned's desperate need to be heard and understood and just wanting some love, peace and settled happiness for both him, his family and his friends. And this, this is a 5 out of 5 film, I'm just saying that straight off the bat. It's got a great cast, led by George Mackay, who it was in 1917, and you might also find familiar faces from things like Sons of Anarchy, The Babadook, Tolkien, Jojo Rabbit, and basically everything ever. So seriously, yeah, there's, there's not a bum note in the cast, everyone's fantastic. Also, from the point of view of a film lover, I mean, this is amazing stuff, and the director, Justin Wurzel, has done an amazing job with this film, and as he's done the same with previous films before. I mean, he, he made Macbeth, which is frankly just one of the most beautiful films that's ever been shot, and in this he's giving lots of wee nods to other famous Australian classics. So yeah, I really can't recommend this any higher. It's solid entertainment, and you should check it out. And in another semi-historical film, kind of, I also saw Split Image, which is... To be honest, historical only in that it was actually made back in the 70s and it's set then. And it's about how a bunch of high school kids get roped into joining a weird semi-Christian cult run by Peter Fonda and he lures them in and they become workers on his bonkers plantation, which kind of looks like a, a set from a Star Trek episode and it's also sort of a, a commune. And that's basically only the start of the movie and then from there it, most of it is about James Woods who plays a private detective who's helping one of the families of one of the guys kidnap him back out the cult and try and break the brainwashing. And it's kind of an interesting movie and, and it's not like this isn't something that doesn't happen in real life. I mean god, you only have to look up like the Nixium scandal and some of the stuff surrounding that. But yeah, also this film kind of feels like everybody who made it probably took way too many drugs when they were making this movie and the end result makes it a kind of a strange quirky film. I mean, it's 2 out of 5 to be honest. It's not a brilliant movie. It's vaguely entertaining, but you'll never watch it again and it's just an odd little obscure curiosity. Another movie I watched, or more correctly, another movie I finished watching was The Mist, the Frank Darabont film from a while back based on the Stephen King short story. Not to get confused with The Fog, which is about ghost pirates. This is The Mist, which is about monsters and things. But yeah, anyway, the reason I say it's a film I finished watching is it's one that I actually started out watching over a year ago and then had to stop because the phone went or something and I just never got around to finishing it because I was kind of like, eh, when I was about halfway through it. But now I have, and it's actually pretty interesting. And basically, it's a film where a guy and his son and a mate go down to a big shopping centre in town and then suddenly enrolls a giant cloud of mist that seems completely unnatural and then folk come running out of it scared or injured and weird giant hellish beasties start coming from the depths of it and start killing folk. And of course, this being a Stephen King story, it turns into not just a story about monsters but a story of clashing personalities and half the cast of The Walking Dead are in it arguing over what to do for most of the runtime. And it's not a bad movie. I mean, it's a bit cheesy but it's almost clearly intentionally so. I mean, in fact, if you've got the Blu-ray like I did for it, then there's actually two versions of the film and one of them's in black and white. And it's clear that that's what they were going for is this sort of 1950s horror movie style thing. So yeah, I mean, definitely if you watch it in black and white, you'll have a lot of fun with it. Although there is a cheesy aspect as also, as well as it, some aspects of it being a bit too Stephen King-ish at times. So, I mean, it's a solid three to five and a bit of a giggle. Well, right up until, well, well, if you've seen it, you'll know exactly what I mean. You'll see. If you haven't, 
you'll learn. Also interesting, there is apparently a TV show adaptation of this, and I've not seen that yet, so I, I can't really comment on it. And according to all accounts, it's a little bit slow and it got cancelled at the end of one season, so who knows? Maybe I'll check that out, maybe not. But in the meantime, yeah, as I said, the film, it's okay. Next up was a Netflix documentary film called My Octopus Teacher, and that's all about a diver who spent a year hanging out in a reef with a wee octopus, all examining its actions and befriending it over the course of its wee life, because it turns out that they only live for like a year or two. Anyway, this guy, it turns out, is a cameraman and he was having a bit of a midlife crisis and decided to start doing some filming in the sea. And he starts to get his mojo back and tells some interesting stories about the life of this wee octopus and, you know, what she got up to over the course of that year. And it's just plainly a very interesting documentary, although you will find yourself reeling your eyes now and again at how clearly this guy knows very little about octopi and such like, but then again, he's a, he's a cameraman, he's not a scientist. But still, yeah, you know, I'd give it a 3 out of 5. It's not a long thing, you know, it's nice, it looks incredibly pretty, and you get to see lots of fun underwater stuff happening. It's a wee slice of life, shaped into a semi-inspirational bit of storytelling. Another curious, but really quite interesting film I saw this month was a Spanish movie from the 1960s called Spirit of the Beehive, or El Espiritu de la Colmena, which is a quite bizarre, almost silent movie about a six-year-old girl living in a rural village in Spain. And her and her sister end up watching Frankenstein one day at the local town hall, but she becomes convinced that he's a ghostly spirit that lives in a well in an abandoned farmhouse nearby. So she ends up wandering around and meets like an anti-Franco partisan soldier and at the same time her dad's kind of obsessed with bees and his beehives and writing about them and her mum keeps writing letters to some guy who may or may not be the same soldier and it's kind of a really beautiful and sombre film and like an awful lot of mid 20th century Spanish films it's all basically about Franco and the fascist state and all that stuff because that was basically all anybody seemed to make a film about after it finished and they were making films secretly about that in the middle of it. But yeah, instead of beating you over the head about it, it's kind of subtle and dreamlike. But it's also clear that an awful lot of later films, especially stuff like Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth, are very clearly inspired by this. Or at least, you know, they took a lot of like little nods from it. And it's a little bit artsy-fartsy, and it might be a bit too vague for some folk, but I'd recommend giving it a shot. I mean, I'd say, you know, it's a good 4 out of 5, especially for, like, an, if you like art movies and stuff like that. But just in case, you know, you get worried, remember, not everything I saw was good. Some of it was absolute crap, and oh boy did I have a garbage one this month. Night Hunter is a Henry Cavill film with Ben Kingsley, you know, Sir Ben Kingsley, and this girl who I think was the girl off of Bones, um, I don't know. Anyway, it's all about how Big Henry is a cop, and he's a good cop, but he's a good cop with a chip on his shoulder about men, because men are bad, and he keeps telling his little daughter that men are bad, and that only gets compounded when he ends up meeting Ben Kingsley and his teenage gal partner who they kind of like go around luring bad guys into teenage prostitute honey traps and then drugging and castrating them and then robbing them of loads of money. Because remember, men are bad and only good cops and good criminal judge people are good in this story. Um, both groups of them end up finding this big mansion where this creepy nut job has been keeping kidnapped girls in cages in the basement. But when they finally catch the guy, he turns out he's basically insane and kind of mentally ill. I mean, or basically almost like he's got the mind of a child. Or does he? Is it all an act? And I've got to be honest, this is just a terrible movie. I mean, the cop bits don't make any sense. I mean, anyone who's ever seen a cop TV show will be put for, like finding holes in this stuff. The story about the vengeance castrators doesn't add up in any way, and especially when they get captured by the police a few times and the police just never charge them with anything despite having loads of evidence. And everybody in this story seems to be the world's best hacker when the story suits it, and then a complete idiot when it doesn't. I mean, the police, as I said, don't arrest Ben Kingsley because he's an ex-judge, and they don't have the proof they say that he's been chopping willies off left, right and centre. But they kind of do, but they don't really care, and then there's a bit where there's a bomb threat in the police station, and they don't even bother evacuating the prison cells, so they then just let folk wander in and out during it, and nobody seems to care, and people are standing right up beside the guys in the bomb disposal outfits just having conversations. And there's loads of other like stupid stuff that just makes no sense in this story. And everybody involved looks either confused or bored. And what it feels like is this is almost like the rough cut of a bad TV cop show's pilot. And then somebody had said, right, but over the season we're going to have this happen and that happen. And instead of doing that, they just went, ah, oh, hell with it. Let's just make a two-hour movie and just cut out everything that make anything made sense. And holy heck, I mean, this is just awful. One out of five film. Seriously. And I only give it that one because there's some nice shots in the film and the actors are actually pretty decent actors who are trying their best with a script that isn't fit to be used as toilet paper. So yeah, don't watch this garbage. Not even if you love the guy of The Witcher more than toasted bread and cheese. It'll still be rubbish. It'll be the rubbishest thing that ever rubbished this year. 
don't watch Night Hunter. It sucks. Seriously. And things barely got any better when the next thing I watched was Cold Light of Day, which is ironically not The Cold Light of Day, which is another Henry Cavill film that's an action movie and is apparently pretty rubbish. As bad as that could be, I doubt it was as bad as Night Hunter. But yeah, now this it turns out was a low rent British indie movie about a serial killer called Dennis Nilsson. That's a real person. And it just got re-released. And oh, it's an ugly mess of a movie. Now, I mean, it's not that unusual for people to do films about serial killers and stuff, and those stories, they can be done well. I mean, heck, they've literally, last month, they released a TV show called Dez about exactly the same killer, but they had David Tennant, you know, the Doctor Who guy, playing the role, and apparently it was really good. And, you know, Tim Roth did that in Rillington Place thing a few years ago, and that was decent enough. But this is just horrible. It's scrappily made, it's badly edited, it's horribly written, and it's all shot on really super grainy 16mm film stock, and it just makes it look really ugly. To its credit, it is marginally better than Night Hunter, but only by a little. And only because the reasons it's bad are completely different reasons from the reasons Night Hunter is bad. But yeah, I just, I wouldn't bother with this. As I said, if you want to know something about the Dennis Nelson thing, watch the David Tennant TV show. I'm pretty confident that you'll definitely have a better time with that. But yeah, two out of five. And to round it all out, in a kind of literary historical kind of way, I also watched The Personal History of David Copperfield, which is made by Armando Anucci, who, if you're not into British comedy shows and things, he made a TV show called In the Thick of It, as well as a lot of other things. But that one is one where the Doctor Who guy plays a scary, sweary political whip in the UK government that, until a few years ago, kind of felt like a sort of parody, but these days doesn't actually seem that far off reality. Anyway, in this you've got the guy who played Slumdog Millionaire and he plays David and he tells the story of his life, how it's all been kind of weirdly realised in an over the top way with interesting colours and sort of strange transitions and things. But yeah, basically it's the story of David Copperfield, you know, Charles Dickens's semi-autobiographical book and one of his most famous novels. And to be honest, whether you like this probably is going to depend an awful lot on how much you like Charles Dickens's books and his writing, since really most of that is kind of, I went from here to there and I went from there to there and I went from there to there and these are all the people I met along the way and a lot of it is about the crazy characters that David meets. And they're all played by the utter cream of British acting talent, most of whom are doing really, really bizarre accents and they seem to be having a fantastic time making the film. And I thought it was quite nice fun. It's a little bit slow, and I'm not really that big a Charles Dickens fan. I mean, other than the fact that I love A Christmas Carol and Scrooge and stuff like that. But yeah, it's a nice film. It wasn't boring, and it made me chuckle a few times, and it was nice to see all these actors. So it's getting a three out of five. Um, whether you'll like it, I honestly couldn't say. It's not, it's not a bad film, and yeah, if you don't know the story of David Copperfield, it's probably one of the best places to see it. So yeah, check it out. It's not bad. Not bad at all. So yeah, that was my October. Not a terrible month when it comes to movies, um, but not one that was especially great either. It was just fine, which to be honest is in keeping with the rest of the year we've been having. And to answer any questions if people have been wondering where I am, well, I've still been about, it's just, you know, lockdown, everything, everything's been going on, there's been a lot of like stuff happening in terms of not work stuff as much, but there has been a lot of work stuff just in the last little while, which has actually kept me a wee bit busy. But before that, there was nothing much going on, and frankly, I was just a wee bit down and depressed and didn't really feel like making videos. So yeah, hopefully this is everything kicking back in. There's going to be more stuff coming up on the channel soon. So yeah, till next time, I've been Ian, and these have been my grumpy opinions. And a special thanks to everybody listening, and especially my patrons, and most especially to Michelle Forbes and Judith Coloma, my top tier patrons. Thank you everybody. Everybody stay safe. Cheerio.